So we carry on with our explanation for chapter seven, railway economics and strategic management. And in the previous section, we have talked how you would develop a strategy as a railway CEO who has been thinking from economical concepts and supply and demand until you have reached the stage that you develop a strategy. And now we need to think about some of the accounting principles that you should be knowing and some of the assets valuation principles that also you should be knowing in order to be able to actually finance your project. So without further ado, let's have a look at the second section. And the second section will start from this part, Railway Economics and Accounting. So the section content is about accounting versus economics, why accounting is important, as well why economics is important. Assets valuation, how do we value our assets and what is the assets life cycle? Then we'll talk about assets management. This is a concept that will help you to build a strategy implemented on your assets and iterate through it. And we'll talk about PASS 55, the standard for the Institute of Asset Management. We'll also talk about assets financing principles, how I can finance my project or how I can finance my newly new assets and how I can finance my projects, mentioning some of the examples of assets financing in the railway. So accounting versus economics, and this is an important one. Um, so in order to be able to get some funds or in, in order to apply for finance or in order to talk with investors, you really need to demonstrate some uh, accounting, uh, accounting statements and accounting sheets. And there are some standardized accounting sheets, like the balance sheet, the income statement, where you can ask any, uh, any public company to provide them. And most of, pub, uh, most of the public companies have these balance sheets and income statements available, for, uh, uh, for available on the internet or available for any potential investor. So with that, accounting is a standardized basis for reporting to financiers. And it's also a standardized basis for payment of taxes. You need to think about revenue, cost, and net income as a basic component. But also you should think about uh, assets and liabilities and profit and loss. So let's have a look at this balance sheet. And this balance sheet, there is assets, the current assets. What, what is the inventory I have? What are the accounts receivable? What's the cash? All of these are your assets. But also if there is property and equipment which we can talk about the land value, the buildings you have, and other assets. Then the total assets value is that much. And you need always to, the balance sheet should always balance between the total assets and the total liabilities. The current liabilities you have, you have account payable, you need to pay those guys. You have notes that it's payable. And the total liabilities is that much. But also you include, include your equity shares, the common stock, stock, the additional bidding capital, and the treasury stock. You also want to bid put this in the total liabilities of shareholders equity. So it's liability versus assets. This is the basic balance sheet principles. Let's have a look at the income statement. You would think about your revenues and your expenses. So this is the total revenue. You have two million in revenue, but you have cost of goods sold, advertising, depreciation, rent, payroll taxes, and you end up with net income or with net loss. So as a, a organization CEO, these are the ABC of demonstrating an income, uh, demonstrating statements to investors. These are the basic ones. And we are talking about, we are not talking about startups, but we are talking uh, an established companies. They should have proper balance sheets and proper income statements in place. Now about economics, but this is accounting and this accounting can apply for maybe a three months, quarterly, annual basis. But sometimes you need to think about economics, which will help you to think about projects on the, longs, on the longer run. 
five years, 10 years, 15 years. And with that, you need to understand the time value of money. You need to uh, demonstrate your understanding of net present value, the internal rate of return and the return on investment. So this is what we, this is economics, long-term view and accounting, short-term view, and those has to be demonstrated to potential financiers, but not only that. So let us just start with the fact that many railway companies enjoy subsidies from the government that they might make them profitable. So there is a subsidy from the government, so it's against that. You should always have some kind of justification to the government and to the public to get that a subsidy. There is a, a, there is a depreciation, and with depreciation we talk about there is a, the assets you have, you manage, might be aging, and you need to understand the value of these assets. What's the value of my buildings? What's the value of my bridges? What's the value of my rolling stock? What's the value of my track? And so you, we, have, we have spent $1 million to build this building, and it's losing $100,000 every year in depreciation. So you need to understand your assets, the value of these assets as well, to present them to anyone who's interested in your company. And some of the expected asset life, buildings in 20 to 50 years, track 10 to 60 years, bridges 20 to 100 years. And this is now you have provided proper income statements, proper balance sheets, you, you have done proper valuation for your assets. And now you need to talk about the social and economical benefits. That's a fundamental part of the railway. What's the direct benefits to passengers? What's the benefits to reducing congestion? What's the benefits of reducing pollution? What's the benefit for employment and increasing property in value? This is fundamental, and you need to try to quantify this to present it to any financer. Now, railway accounting, to just to think about railway accounting, there is an income and there is costs. And income, to understand income, you need to think about your transport revenue income, the fare box income, the commercial, uh, the, the tickets that maybe uh, you, you, you sell some advertising on your trains or adver advertising on, on your uh, stations, concession fares, and local authority contracts. Maybe you get some subsidies. So there is income that is coming from transport, and there is non-transport income, and there is grants. So this is basic. This is the revenue of any railway organization. Now, just to have a look at details. Now, what are the costs? There is costs for labor costs, the drivers, the, the maintenance workers, the, uh, the engineers who are working on your projects. And there is purchased materials and services, the materials you buy, the equipments you buy. And there is depreciation and renewals. So now you have a basic understanding of the income that is coming to your railway organization and the costs. And you have an understanding of how to apply, how to show uh, income statements and how to show social economic benefits. Now you need to think how you need to deploy your capital. So you can deploy your capital on fixed assets, I, or you make you do some invents, investments. So fixed assets, tangible investments, or you do some current assets like stocks, which can change in value, debitors, cash, or current. And you can think about your current liabilities as well. What are the things that I have to pay? Now, this is the basic 101 understanding of economics and accounting. Now, you need to do some assets valuation. Now, you really need to do the proper assets valuation. And assets equal liabilities plus equity. This is what assets and part of the uh, equity would put your fear. Uh, and assets equal liability plus equity. And on this side, you would put the value of your fixed assets. And the assets life cycle, before I explain this curve, the assets life cycle goes through an initial investment, operation and maintenance, renewal and upgrade, then recovery and disposal. So you buy the asset, you run it, and sometimes you maintain it. And for example, you, you might upgrade it and eventually either you sell it or you salvage it you, uh, or you, you dispose, uh, dispose it. So this is the basic assets life cycle. And you need to remember the assets life cycle 
all the time. This is something that will have for five years, for 10 years. This is something that will have, then will renew. If you want to be a proper asset management, you really need to understand your assets life cycle. The assets valuation start by understanding the original cost. What was the cost that we have purchased these assets? What was the replacement cost? How much did we spend on replacing it or maintaining it? Replacement as used or replacement as new? Or what is the cost if we replace it used? Or what is the cost if we replace it new? Or we use other costs? So you, you come up with a valuation for your assets. And I just want to stop on maintenance. And a lot of people say that you would have systems that in the beginning they would have like a bathtub curve. They would be, uh, they, they would have many failures, then you would reach a level of reliability, then you have another failures. And what happens in reality, that that bathtub curve actually applies to only 4% of assets along with wear out. So the age related failures in railways is only 11%. And most of the maintenance activities, most of the failures would ha will happen in a random way. There will be an initial breakdown, this is agreed, but then you would have that random all along the remaining period, which is around 89%. So you should really not think about the bathtub curve as the key thing about the assets maintenance or assets failures. You should think that you would be having failures in a random way. Now let's come to the assets management. Now we have a proper accounting statements, we have reached some assets maintenance, and we need to provide an assets management plan that this is how we are going to manage our assets for a year, two years, three years, or even 30 years. And to do that, you would start by understanding your strategic goals and your strategy, which you have done in section one. Then you would think about where I would be spending my capital, where I would be, uh, I, where I would be building my assets portfolio. Then you will be thinking about what are systems I will use to manage those assets. Then you would do the assets life cycle. You'll create assets, buildings, bridges, railways, uh, oil factor factories. You will utilize them. You will maintain them. You will renew or display, uh, dispose them. So this, is, so this is the basic concept of assets management. And to have it in another view, you'll have your organizational strategic goals and plan being influenced by commercial and the environment, investors, legislation, or customers. Then you would have your people organization building your strategy and plan and doing assets management, decis uh, assets management decisions by acquiring assets, knowing about making these decisions based on assets information they have, then they will go through the assets life cycle. They will acquire them, they will operate them, they will maintain them, they will dispose them. And this is where assets management managers sit. They would keep, they would keep getting information about the assets and run the uh, asset life cycle. Eventually, they need also to do a risk and review, some risk scenarios and review them, and to add that to any potential change in the organizational strategic plan. So go to the past 55, which is a standard that developed by the Institute of Assets Management. Have a look at some of the best practice, practices they have in, in oil and gas, in, in, uh, in, in, in railways, in electrification, in utility companies. And maybe, some, maybe you would benefit from that. So if you are working in, a, in a, an infrastructure owner organization or an assets, or you have an assets portfolio to manage, I am the Institute of Assets Management will be a great source of knowledge. Now let's talk about assets financing. So now we have our assets and we need to finance them. And by financing them, we need to think about different aspects. We need to think about, we need to think about the company performance ratio. Now you need to to finance the company or your assets. There is long-term finance. You can do debt finance, do, go, go to bonds and issue or get some loans. You have equity finance. You can provide some shares or you can finance from retained profits. But, but any one of those 
would acquire you to have a proper understanding of your company performance. What is my turnover? What is my debt? How I will finance my debt? What is my equity? How I can finance my equity? What is the free cash flow that I have? What is my net profit? Am I distributing dividends? Am I distributing profits on an annual basis? But also you need to think about how you would be financing your railway projects. What are the options? You can get a government loan. You can have a bank loan. You can have a debt or a bond or access the debt market. And you might have convertible loan stock. So this is a loan that you get. And maybe if you achieve certain targets, you, uh, you can uh, the loan can become uh, can become shares. Now that is being said, uh, on a long-term projects, you should always think about the time value of money. And you should think about your net present value and the internal rate of return and interest. So this will be the initial cost of investment. And this is how much income you get and how much expenses. And you need to think about the interest that you would be having on these years and you, to provide a proper understanding of the time value of money to see if this is a profitable project or not. If you have an engineering economics book or class, this is a 101 engineering economics and you need to be doing this on railway projects. So what are the railway projects that would be needing finance? There are different projects. It's not always about building a new line. That's a big project. So you would have a rolling stock. I need to acquire a new rolling stock. I need, a, I need to, uh, to upgrade my signaling system. I need to develop a new line or I need to do a station retail development. So, and you would be doing some finance. So you would, the rolling stock, having a rolling stock project is acceptably commercial. Because it's a vehicle, the risk is low and the public benefit is high, but maybe they would not pay more in tickets but maybe the, the benefit cannot be quantified. The signaling, the finance would be, uh, the finance of these projects is, uh, can be good and if the results are achieved, but the problem is you can't salvage this and sometimes high technology and project risk, the public benefit can be very good to have a train every two minutes. So now you need to think about different railway projects and how you finance them. It's not about only building a metro. Maybe I just want to buy a new vehicle or a, a new fleet, or maybe I need to upgrade my signaling systems. And to build a new line, this is a, it's viable for finance, but it's a tight market focus. It's only about certain area that this line is, is uh, serving. You need high planning and the public benefit can be viable. Station retail development, you need to develop a retail area within a station. So finance for this should be easy and it's very high return and the risk medium, but it depends on the station. Public benefit, okay, depending on the services that you are providing. So we stop here. I think now you have a strategy, you have an understanding of assets management. You now, uh, maybe you acquired finance and you need to think about how you will manage project and you will, how you will govern them. And we talked this about this before, but we'll talk about this in details in the coming sections. Have a great evening and see you in this next lecture.